So thank you very much, and uh, it's, it's a real pleasure to be here. I'm going to be talking to you today about a MOOC that uh, we uh, designed together. And I'm going to be talking really about how do we think about collective, collaborative, meaningful learning in a MOOC. Is it possible? We would argue that it is. It's very difficult. It's very challenging. It's also a lot of fun. So I'll try to give you an overview of what we did. I love this graph. I actually didn't put it in my thesis, and I kind of regret that. This is from a, a wonderful book by uh, Pierre Dillenberg called Orchestration Graphs, Modeling Scalable Education. And in this graph, he basically, and this is not a very empirical or scientific graph, but he tries to uh, juxtapose the relationship between group size and richness of learning activities. So we can all imagine if we have two, three, four, five people together, we can do all kinds of very meaningful things. We can do uh, problem solving, case-based reasoning. We can do collaborative designs and, and so on. Uh, but as the group of students keep, we start growing, and we don't have to go to MOOC level, we can talk about undergraduate courses at the University of Toronto, graduate courses, you have 20, you have 30, you have 50, you have 500, and the palette of tools that you have available as an instructor really starts to shrink, right? And so suddenly you're in Con Hall and you're doing, uh, you know, clickers, and maybe that's better than just lecturing, but it's still, it's fairly high up on this graph. Uh, Dillenberg's kind of uh, challenge is that's not a given, right? So can we begin to reverse this curve? Can we begin to climb onto that red scale? Are there ways in which we can actually have really deep and meaningful interactions at large sizes? Are there actually new opportunities that we only have at large sizes? So this work that I will describe, it had a few iterations behind it. It was based on a course that Jim taught for a number of years for pre-service teachers at OISE. And it started out as a small course with 20, 25 students taught very much seminar style, lots of interact interactions, small groups, group presentation, design projects, very tight feedback loops from the teacher. And when I came into the picture, the challenge had been given because of a reorganization at OIC, the course now needs to have 80 students. So from 20 to 80, we're not talking massive, but we are talking rethinking the design of the course. We wanted to really keep what made that course so valuable. And so we had to think a lot about how we could do that from a you know, scripting and a pedagogical perspective, but also from a technical perspective. Because when you have five people, you can do very rich things just using sticky, uh, sticky notes or pieces of paper that you move around. When you have 80 people, if you want to do really complex scripts, then you actually need, I would argue, technology support. So there's a whole chapter about this in my thesis, but I'm not going to go into it too much in detail here. So suffice to say that the experimentation and our experience of redesigning this course uh, was instrumental for us in going the next step to the MOOC. And one of the things that really underlines all of this research is the idea of principle-based curriculum design. Because there's a lot of innovative curriculum design, both at the University of Toronto, with instructors who are experimenting with things in their classes, and with MOOCs and, and other platforms. But a lot of it tends to be kind of ad hoc. It's people having experience, pain points, trying out things. Maybe they read about interesting approaches and, and they iterate around it, which is very valuable. But given that we're learning scientists, we want to base this approach on, on some principles. And Jim's group has for years been working uh, around this uh, KCI model. KCI stands for Knowledge Community Inquiry. And it's a model that's been developed both for at, uh, in graduate courses, but mainly in K through 12. So in, in science classrooms. And it's based on this idea of scaffolded inquiry activities. So we want students to do inquiry. We, want, we don't want them to tell them the knowledge. We want them to find out the knowledge. But we also know that if we make it too open-ended, students get lost. Time gets wasted. Or maybe it's not wasted, but either time, it's time that we don't necessarily have in the formal school system. Uh, so we need to scaffold it. And we also want to encourage students to take the knowledge creation seriously. It's not just busy work, it's, it's consequential to themselves and to others. And uh, we want them to think that other people are relying on their knowledge. So we have a capstone project that kind of forces you to rely on other people's information. And that makes your own inquiry also feel more uh, valuable to yourself. And then there's uh, things like emergent themes, huge voices, accessible learning outcomes, which is key if you want to do anything in, in the university or K-12 setting, and the idea of a community knowledge base that is uh, being fed by these scaffolded inquiry activities and which feeds into uh, the capstone project. 
so there, there are great articles about this. I'm, I'm skipping through it quickly, but this was the really ground truth for, for all of our, our subsequent designs. In the OISI course, we used a lot of different tools. We used Etherpads, it's kind of like Google Docs. We had people in smaller groups. We had the scaffolded prompts and sending information back and forth. But the capstone project was to design a lesson using technology for meaningful pedagogical change, right? So it's not just using some PowerPoints because you can and now you know how to use PowerPoint, but it is what are the, because the, the class itself is about inquiry and technology. So what we want the students to understand deeply is how can these technologies actually transform the way in which you teach. And of course, that means we need to actually let them experience that, not just reading articles about it, but in our class, we need to do that ourselves as well. So this lesson design is a collaborative project that isn't just something that we ask them in the final week, to go off and spend two weeks and, and, and write this, this summative assessment. This is something that we start on the first week of the course and which runs through the entire course like a red thread where we keep uh, doing cycles of peer feedback and where all of the other inquiry activities and the weekly themes feed into this process of lesson design. So, MOOC. Uh, this is a, a great graphic, I think it was initially from a blog post. People have played a lot with these, these four, four words. And in fact, a lot of people are, are playing with replacing them with other MOOC and, and, and small private for credit online course and all kinds of fun things. And it, it's a very amorphous concept, even though if you say MOOC, people might just think that's Coursera. So it could be a very specific thing as well. I want to give you my history of MOOCs in one slide. Okay, this could be a one hour talk and I'm simplifying a lot here, but I want to give you, especially for some of you, because the context is a little bit broader, at least from where I stand, than maybe um, people, people catch at the surface. So I go back in history to open educational resources. This is... Wiley, David Wiley started some uh, early experiments, and that's one of the ways I got hooked. I took one of his courses as a, in my last year of my undergrad. Then you have the first MOOCs. Now they're called C MOOCs. Back then they were just called MOOCs because that was the only thing there was, which was Stephen Downs and George Siemens, two Canadian uh, researchers, who had this pedagogical theory called connectivism, which was really the idea of, of networks, that, that the networks in the world and the networks between objects actually kind of are isomorphic with the way in which our brains function. And so the way in which we should learn should also be structured around these kind of networks. And at the same time, you have the peer-to-peer -peer university, which I was involved in, which was also an effort in creating learning communities or study groups around these resources. Out of this activism, there was a, great, uh, there was a real community around edu bloggers, the open education blogosphere. People came up with new theories, peeragogy. There's a, there's a book published about, you know, what does it look like when people are learning as peers and there is no instructor? And how can we support that? Connectivism, which I just mentioned, right? Network learning, personal learning environments. There was this whole space that was not very well connected to the formal learning research, but that, but that was very exciting. Parallel to that, and parallel to the Open Educational Resources, you had the Open Learning Initiative at Carnegie Mellon, which had these very expensive, very professionally produced courses, not social at all, you were the one person doing it, but what they had was these simulations and these ways of, of doing very rich learning uh, experiences for, you know, intro stats, intro economics, intro math, and so on. So you had this idea of, you could actually scale this up. And you have Khan Academy, which, to me, kind of introduced this idea of the value of five to 10 minute videos that weren't a two hour recording of a lecture at MIT with the, you know, the boards that slide up and down and all that stuff, but it was really a, more a person sitting next to you on a tablet showing you something uh, where you could you know, move around and you could uh, steer the video as you wanted. Then we get the first X MOOCs. Again, back then they were just called MOOCs because people had forgotten about the first MOOCs, and so they introduced C and X just to distinguish them later, which was from Stanford. Introduction to Machine Learning, Introduction to Artificial Intelligence, boosted by New York Times, 160,000 people signed up, and everyone said, wow, something is happening here. 
We got XMOOC platforms like Coursera, edX, Udacity, and by now there's a bunch of other ones that have followed. We got this burgeoning field of learning analytics, which uh, started becoming very interested in the massive amount of data that were being uh, generated by these platforms because they catch every single click that you make and they have 50,000 students in a single course, so you can imagine. And you start getting some interest in this concept of learning at scale. Is there a theory of learning at scale? What does that look like? There's an annual conference. There's some people who are dabbling in it, but it's very, very early, early stages. So that was my extremely simplified context. Okay, what did we actually do? We had the opportunity to take this course that was designed for pre-service teachers at OIZ and turn it into a MOOC on edX for in-service teachers. So this would be for professional development for people who are already working as teachers. And it was a collaboration between the University of Toronto with uh, Jim Slaughter's lab and the University of Toronto schools led by Principal Rosemary Evans and a number of her staff and teachers being involved. And that was a really exciting opportunity because it meant that we could unify the academic and the theoretical with the practical and experience-based. And that, of course, is very important when it comes to credibility among teachers. They are much more receptive to someone saying, this is what I did in my classroom, this is how it worked, versus someone saying, here's uh, some research from the University of Toronto. So we have this MOOC. We don't know how many people are going to come. We know it's going to be fewer than some of the huge MOOCs because we are specifically targeting in-service teachers. But you know, is it 1,000? Is it 10,000? We don't know. What are they looking for? What are we going to do with them? How are we going to deliver a, a meaningful experience to them? And what are some of the design constraints that we have to consider? The first one, at least for me, because I'm kind of a techie, I'm thinking about the technical aspects. Thinking, OK, no matter what kind of pedagogical script we come up with, can we really do any of it? Because if we can't, then the discussion is kind of moot. And I've been working at this stage uh, with um, Open.U Toronto managing data for edX and Coursera MOOCs at the University of Toronto for several years. So I knew quite well how these platforms worked and what kind of constraints they offer. And they're fairly strict. For those of you who have never seen an edX course, this is how one, this is not our course. This is a random edX course, but they all look fairly similar. You have, apart from a few different tabs on top that you don't usually really use after you've, you've come the first time, most of the stuff happens here. So typically you have week by week, although you don't have to. And then for each week, you have some subheadings. And then you have these activity streams. And these activity streams can contain a lot of different components. So a lot of it will be video, like you see here. It could be text. It could be various forms of uh, automatic assessment, exams that you get graded. And there's also some uh, discussion forums and peer review baked into the platform. That's about what you get. That's not what we were looking for. We were looking for something a lot more interesting. Now, how can you extend this platform? There's basically two ways. One way is all of these components are called X blocks because they're from edX. You could theoretically write your own X blocks, and some people have. The only problem is you can't run them on edX because edX is actually an open code base. So you could download this and run it on your personal laptop or on the OIC server, and then you can install any X block you want. But if you want it to be on edX.org with the kind of cachet and, and publicity that that includes, they currently don't have a safe way for you to run your own Xbox. So that was a kind of a non-starter for us. The other way is that you can use something called LTI. And LTI basically says, I'm going to put another website in this space. And the only thing that that website gets from edX is the username and email of that student if the student agrees and then a unique identifier so that you know that it's the same student coming as the last time. That's all. It has no access to any other part of the edX system. But that's what we ended up using, and it worked out very well for us. So our tech setup, in a, in a systematic way, is that we have edX, we used it for videos, um, for further readings, for discussion forums, for grades, uh, they issued a course certificate if you complete the course, and then, of course, you, you sign up for the course there, and you have the syllabus. So these are fairly simple things. I mean, you can do this in Blackboard, and Canvas, and anywhere. You have some videos, you click on the next, there's week two, there's some videos, there's some readings. But that's the shell that we had. And that's what the shell that some students at least were familiar with. But then we have all these other activities running off our LTI server that we custom wrote, and that was running off OISE. Most of that was, and I'll show you those components, were uh, custom written. And then we embedded uh, three external things. We have a Confluence Wiki, Etherpad, which is like Google Docs, uh, collaborative live writing, and Google Hangout for last week. 
one of the important things here, by the way, is that we had a single, and I'll show you this in a moment, we had a single server that was serving all of these components. And that meant that it knew something about the student from one component and it could use that data in another component. And so even though the LTI protocol itself gives you extremely little information, the fact that it tells you that it's the same student as logged in last time, and you run all of these activities on your own server, let us actually do the interesting things that we would. If these were all different components, there would be no way for them to talk to each other and uh, we wouldn't have been able to do the things we were doing. Then past the technical limitations, of course, there's a lot of pedagogical constraints, right? So we're targeting a specific group, in-service teachers. Now they have some strengths, right? They have lots of experience that they can bring to this. They're not blank slates. They might have specific problems that they're looking to solve or challenges. And they're teachers, so they should theoretically know how to learn and, and follow rules, although we, we don't know that. But they're very busy people. And they're not just learning for fun. They're really looking for something that's useful for them. And if it's not useful, they'll drop it like a hot potato. But we think that MOOCs are a really great solution to professional development for teachers. Because it, it, it was, we ran this during summer when teachers have a little bit of time off. It was mostly asynchronous, so you can log in when you want to. It begins to foster a community, not just of people, but also of resources that hopefully will be much more long-term useful to the teachers than coming in for a one-day workshop where you're listening to a bunch of people and you're going back into your classroom the next day. This course was fully online. The course that we taught at OISE used a lot of technolo technology support, but we were in the classroom four hours every week. And there's a lot of things, even with 80 people, that you can do much more quickly when you're all together and when you're synchronous. The coordination of different things are just, is just much more flexible. So how do we deal with the fact that this is all online and it's mostly asynchronous? I'll come back to that. And people who come to this course, they have varying levels of interest and varying levels of commitment. Some people just want to watch the videos. That's fine, that's legitimate. Other people might want to, or at least are open to the idea of engaging deeply with other people, with creating materials. How do we accommodate those different groups? Or do we just say one group is welcome and the other one is not? How do we accommodate them? And ideally, how do we make those two groups actually benefit from each other's presence? Related to this, we all know that most people, a lot of people in MOOCs will not complete the MOOC. If it's a completely individualistic MOOC where all you do is watch videos and do quizzes, at least that doesn't affect other people. If you have a MOOC that's deeply based on collaboration, on teams, on interdependence, then that could be a fatal problem, right? So you have to design around that. One of the things we did to address this issue of different levels of expectation and was the idea of different participation tracks or strands. And we were inspired by uh, a previous MOOC called the Learning Analytics MOOC, which had the concept of the blue pill or the red pill, right? The matrix kind of idea. So they're saying, you're coming to this MOOC, there's two paths you can choose. You can, you can do the boring X MOOC, you'll get some videos, you'll get some quizzes, it'll still be a good learning experience, or you can jump down the rabbit hole and you know, it'll be a completely different thing. So we were inspired by that concept, and we thought of, of, of the course audience as this kind of set of uh, circles. Outside of this circle, you have the public, those who never even went to the website, because in fact some of the resources generated by this course are now public to the world. So they're still kind of part of the audience, even though they didn't participate in the course. Then you have the auditors, okay? Those are people who went to the course but never signed up to do any interactive ex exercises. 8,000 people. Some of them left right away. Some of them stayed you know, through the whole course, watched lots of videos, but didn't want to engage with any of the interactive stuff. Then we have the people who, and I'll show you how you make that choice, but you have the people who did uh, register and wanted to do some interactive stuff. They didn't want to do the design track though. So about 2,000 people. And then you have the people who jump down the rabbit hole and they say, I want to be in a team and I want to create a lesson design. So it's a big task. About 400 people. Not all completed, of course. This is the people who signed up for things. How does the course start? Typically, the course starts in week one. And yet we thought, first of all, this is a six-week course because you can't make a MOOC too long. That's a very short time to create community, to incalculate community norms and new ways of thinking about what it means to create knowledge. And is there a way we can hack this? Well, what if a teacher signs up a, a month early? The course is opening in a month, come back then. Why, why can't we take advantage of that one month that we have that teacher's attention? So we created this week zero, which was, we called it the teacher's lounge. So if you signed up for the course before it started, you would still be let in. And you could wait with others instead of waiting by yourself outside. 
And what did we want to do in that period? We wanted an epistemic treatment. So we wanted to start telling people that this was a different kind of a course, just like every MOOC, as Jim pointed out, um, and that we really expected people to contribute knowledge and that they would benefit from that. We began collecting data about the students. We know nothing about these students. And the way edX works is that you never get any information that the students have contributed to other courses. So even though someone has taken 10 MOOCs and, and posted things and answered surveys, they're a black box to you. So we start learning about who our students are. And we start forming groups. And then we also start collecting resources. The people who come in, they're asked to fill out this survey. And the survey is the way in which we get their data onto our server. Okay? We don't get any of the edX data. But we were able to, because of LTI, to force this. So if you ever went to an interactive component later in the course and you hadn't signed up, we wouldn't know who you were, and we would say, please go back to week one and do this thing. And so people who went through this process are the ones who count as either design track or foundation track. People who didn't are the auditors who are out there somewhere watching videos. Collecting this data, and again, because it's done on our servers, we have full control over the data and we can see live graphs and stuff like that, whereas the edX data, you get it once a, month, once a week in a, in a very opaque data dump. A, we can get some aggregate data. So we can get a very quick read on who's signing up, what kind of interest do they have. And we also start getting a map of who these students are because they uh, provide tags. And so this isn't just a, a word cloud, but it's actually a, a semantic map where uh, you, know, you kind of see where people are positioned in terms of what tags they select and what other tags are selected by the same people. And so having this information helps us form the groups because remember, we didn't know how many people would come, we didn't know who they would be. This is still not the entire population of our course, this is the people who are coming early. But they are helping us inform the design for everyone who comes later. So with all this data that we're collecting on our server, we can create this student model, which we continue to update as the student goes through different components and which the components rely upon to do conditionals. So when you come to a component, it knows which groups you're part of, it knows which resources you've seen, it knows what tags you've selected, and it can show you content intelligently based on that. So these are just some of the things that we collected as we went along. So we wanted to design a hierarchy of groups. You kind of start with the MOOC, everyone who's in the MOOC, and then we have special interest groups. Because remember, we have teachers who are uh, kindergarten teachers, we have kinder teachers who are high school auto tech, and in fact, even though we didn't ask for them, but we also got people who are working in museums, in higher education, uh, and so on. So these have very different interests. And we wanted to try to group them together so that they could, could better support each other and, and find resources that were relevant to each other. And then we have the design groups, which are in the SIGs, and again, are more specific, where it's people who have very similar interests that find each other. Um, and so one way of thinking of this is, as the groups become smaller, we go from very abstract and generalized, Jim might give a lecture, which is about the big principles, and then as you move down, it becomes more applied and specific, because now you have some auto tech teachers who all sit around and say, well, how does this apply to us? How can we use tangible? How can we use virtual reality? How can we use wikis in our teaching? In addition, the interaction mode goes from largely one way, although this might not be true in a MOOC. This is true in a classroom right now, it's largely one way. In the MOOC, there might be ways around this, but either way, as the groups get smaller, you certainly have the opportunity to have much more interaction. So you have this movement. However, what we also wanted to uh, avoid was to have all the good ideas get trapped in the small groups, right? You start with the big abstract, and then you have the small groups discussing really exciting things. Is there a way for that to kind of bubble back up or to go laterally across groups? That was also a design goal that we had. So based on, on the information that we gathered from those students who came early, we created 18 uh, special interest groups. So these were designed to have roughly the same number of students in each group, although some, um, like in formal learning in museums, it was smaller, but because it was so, so special, we, we made it into its own group uh, anyway. But we didn't actually force students to join a specific group based on their tags. We, we still let it open to them, and based on the groups that people actually ended up joining, we combined a bunch of these so that we had groups with a good size of students for, for uh, lively discussions at the end. And that's the, the groups you see on the right there. So we're still in week zero. The course has still not started. And the students are now registered. They're now ready to do, they're like, okay. Let's, you know, you have all these people who said, I'm not really ready to get that engaged. I just want to watch some videos. But what if we could have you contribute to our collective knowledge base with very little commitment? 
If you are a teacher, then I'm sure you have a favorite resource, a favorite tech resource for your subject. Type it in. Takes you two minutes. With 2,000 teachers, we now have 2,000 resources. Now, here's three resources that were suggested by other people in your SIG. Can you have a quick look at them? Maybe add some tags, maybe rate them? Now we have 2,000 resources all tagged and rated. That's a really valuable resource, and yet it took each individual person a few minutes. So we started by saying, can you please submit some resources? And that hopefully was also starting to get them thinking about this idea that they're contributing to this course. They're not just, just taking. Finally, the course is starting. Week one, and you know, there was so much stuff going on in this course that we still wanted to give people some kind of stability and some kind of uh, stable structure. So we had a fairly similar script every week. You started with watching videos, because this is a MOOC, and then they had a personal reflection, they had a discussion, in their SIG groups, they did the self-assessment of that discussion, which was uh, for their grades, and then we had different inquiry activities, and that's where kind of we went crazy with our, with our design. But the videos, you know, it's easy to skip over them when I'm talking about this complex design, but these were actually a huge amount of work, really, really well done. So Jim did weekly welcome videos, and these were kind of done each week. So some of the other stuff was pre-produced, but this was done every week because he could reflect on what had been said in the discussion forum, questions people had raised, and so on. And then Jim would give a theoretical introduction to the topic, kind of similar to what he would give at OAC. Then we would give, Rosemary Evans would give kind of a school perspective from a, from a principal. And then we would have a classroom teacher sharing practical applications. This is what I did in my classroom. This is a lesson I designed. This is challenges I had. And by the way, here's a little video clip from me running that script in the class. So, you know, this, this combination of, of kind of theoretical, applied, and, and experiential I think was incredibly valuable. And so if you came to this MOOC, and we, we prided ourselves in that, we said, if you came here and only watched the videos and read the things that we wrote, it's still a really rich resource. We're not gonna skimp on that just because we're doing inquiry activities. Now, you remember the students were adding resources in week zero. In week one, we still give them the chance to add resources if you, add, if you joined late, but now we ask you to review resources. And then, once you review them, you can explore them. So you can look at them here, there's a list. You can see all the resources that your SIG added, but you can also see all the resources from other SIGs if they tagged it as this is applicable to any context, right? So Google Doc would be applicable to any context. A physics simulation would not. So that was one way in which we tried to, to branch between the SIGs, right? So we had a tag cloud. And then we're slowly moving into this lesson design. And this is already first week, and we're, we're not waiting until week six to start to, as a summative project, right? This is the red thread that will go through the entire MOOC. This is the template for the lesson design that they will produce. But they don't see this because it's kind of overwhelming. So we start with what kind of thing do you want to teach? We start with maybe one or two to get them started thinking. As the course moves along, we, we add these prompts and these prompts become gradually more complex. What do you want to teach? That's, that's fairly easy to come up with. How, what's the activity structure? Now we're getting much more specific. Assessment enactment, right? So these are much more complex questions, but by then you'll be ready to answer them because you've gone through the course. To bootstart this process, we, you know, a lot of courses kind of start from zero. They, course, students, uh, teachers teach them year after year, students take them year after year, and they produce valuable resources that get uh, put away, and then we start from a blank slate. In this course, we started by looking at previous lesson designs from the OISI course. So students could explore what, previous, what earlier uh, student generations had created, and they could start thinking about what kind of things they would want to create. And so one of our values, and one of the things that is often done in, in KCI curricula, is the idea of connecting the course to previous and future generations. So we're getting these old lesson designs in from the past, and we're also sending things into the future. So the lesson designs generated by this MOOC are actually public, and I'll share the URL with you, at the end of this presentation, they will be available. The resources that people tagged and sorted, they will be available. So there's a continuity there. I talked about synchronous and asynchronous. And this is one point where we actually came upon this problem. This is, if you don't recognize it, is a postal chess form. People would fill this out and mail it to someone and they would make a move and fill down and mail it back. And to me, this is a great metaphor for trying to coordinate something online when it's asynchronous. Because what we wanted to do we had this idea for a script where initially a student would suggest a lesson design idea. I would like to create a lesson about combinatorics in math. Then, once we had all the ideas, people would vote, and we would see which one got the most votes. Then, 
based, you know, so that people wouldn't join in a lesson that maybe nobody else wanted to do. Then in the third stage, you would choose the lesson design and you would get started. And this is easy to do in a classroom. In 10 minutes, we can get the whole class into different groups. In a MOOC where people might only log in once a week, this would take three weeks before you even got started designing. It doesn't work. So we had to redesign this flow to make it much more open-ended to say, suggest a lesson design and immediately you're entered. And if nobody else comes, you can leave that and you can join another. You know, you still have that flexibility, but it's all within a single step. So for us, that was an interesting, interesting kind of le lesson learned that we only learned as we were in, in the MOOC was almost running. The, this was the interface where people would suggest and we would just ask them for a short description and, uh, and so on. And then they could see which groups had been suggested and, and they could join a group. Uh, we set a max of six people per group. Okay, so we've got a lesson design team. We've got a group of five, six people, and they're now going to do this very complex design process over a number of weeks. They've never met. How do we coordinate that? How do we support that kind of collaboration? Because if we don't, it's going to fail miserably. And I don't know of, uh, know of any other MOOC that has tried to do consistent small teams. Almost all the MOOCs that have had any kind of collaboration, it's been ad hoc. You submit something, someone else is chosen to peer review it because people drop out and because it's hard to, to, to create this kind of collaboration online. So we knew that we had to spend a lot of time thinking about how to support this, because otherwise it wouldn't work. So we came up with this idea of a collaborative workbench. We wanted to give people all the tools that they needed both to do, to access the resources, to do the design, and to communicate and coordinate with their peers in one single interface, instead of using a lot of different tools that would let them get lost. So, once you log, and this would actually change, these tabs up here would change every week. But once you logged in, okay, on the left here you have a persistent chat with only your group members, you're automatically logged into it. And it's persistent, which means it also works as a notice board. So if you write something, someone else logs in, they'll see what you wrote, and they can write something. Then on these tabs, the first one was the weekly prompt. So every week there would be a new prompt that said, welcome to your design group, this is what we want you to do this week, these are the things you have available to you. Um, then, depending on the group, you would have different things. For example, we did the, the, the resources, right? So all the whole uh, class submitted resources. Well, those might be really helpful to you when you're designing your class. So why don't we pull that into a tab here? And you can go and look at those resources when you're trying to come up with, for the first week, what you're actually going to teach. Then later, we're going to do peer reviews, and we're going to pull those in here. And then you have some collaborative tools that you'll see. You'll have an etherpad. Again, it's like Google Docs. Uh, you can see live when other people are writing. You have a new one for each week. You can always go back and look at the previous ones. And that was preceded with prompts. Just like if you, I put you in small groups and I walked around and said, I'd like to talk about this and this, we used Etherpad for that, right? And this was their private scratch pad. So this, could, so this could not be seen by people who were not members of the group. But then you had the wiki, and this is uh, Confluence that's embedded, but again, they don't know about that. They don't have to log in. They're automatically logged in. And this is their face to the, to the world. So this is what is shared with other students when they're asked to do peer review. You know, this is what will be their final artifact. And again, we preceded it with these prompts, and we add prompts every week, because we don't want to overwhelm them with everything during the first week. We talked about coordination when it comes to creating the design groups, but we ran into coordination problems in doing the designs as well. It worked really well the first week, because the first week, it was kind of additive brainstorm ideas for how the lesson will look. Okay, I'll add an idea, you can add an idea, boom, there's no coordination problem. The second week, we asked them to choose one of those ideas. Ah, that's tricky. Because again, these people aren't logging in at the same time. And these are, are very polite and nice teachers. They don't like to override other people. Like if I log in and I see four ideas, I don't feel comfortable saying, I'm gonna just go ahead and choose this and delete the three other ones. So you get a blockage, which is, you know, if you don't resolve that blockage, you can't go forwards. Um, now there's different ways you could solve this, right? One is would, would be to increase synchronicity. Either ad hoc synchronicity, so you could have a way for them to schedule a time to meet, or we even talked about actually saying, you know, this, this MOOC runs from seven to nine until on Wednesday evenings, and if you don't have time, then don't sign up. And at that time, you might be meeting with your local design group. You know that the people who signed up will have time at that slot. And I think that would be interesting in the future to try it. What we tried to do, though, was to make it easier for them to coordinate. So we already had the chat, 
we added an email functionality, and we had to do a bunch of backend work because we needed to, to, to keep anonymity. We couldn't share their emails. We didn't have that right. So all the emails went through a central server where they got stripped of the sender information, got sent to everyone with a unique sender email so that if you reply, it would go to everyone as an email list, but again, without anyone seeing your email. I was kind of proud of that system. It almost didn't get used. Part of it could be because we introduced it late, because I actually had to make it. And part of it could be maybe people didn't feel comfortable imposing. Maybe they felt that that was imposing. I don't know. That'd be interesting to find out. But another thing we did, actually, on, on suggestion of Jim, he said, what if we just send an email to everyone in the group whenever anyone enters the group, the, the group view? And I said, that's kind of imposing to get all these emails into your mailbox. But OK, let's make it really easy to unsubscribe, and let's try it. And so we have, here's an example of this email. Someone entered your collaborative workbench. And the nice thing here is, if you click here, it will send you straight to the workbench already logged in. So you don't have to go to edX, log in, find the link, da da da. You're straight in there. If you click here, you're automatically unsubscribed. Again, no login, no password, no nothing. Just click and that's it. This was a massive success. We have statistics showing that it was very, very frequent that people would get this notification and say, oh, OK, I'll go in, and now I can chat, because now there are two people here, or three. So that was actually a really successful feature. I talked initially about this idea that we had these two strands, and we didn't just want to give a good experience to each of them, but we wanted them to mutually benefit from each other. And there was a bunch of connection points, right? So we start here, we start with adding resources and review all lesson designs. Actually, I skipped, uh, no, so you saw that as well, and people were commenting. All of that feeds into the initial design group meeting, right? And then as the design groups begin the long process of designing their uh, lessons, there's weekly cycles of feedback for peer review. The way we design the peer review, edX has built-in peer review functionality, but it works in a specific way. You have to submit an artifact before you can peer review someone else's. We didn't want to do that. We wanted a lot of people peer reviewing a small number of people. So each person would get lots of peer reviews. And we were not interested in people evaluating, assessing, okay? We don't care if this is good or bad because it's just week one, it's a, it's a, it's a product in process. We're interested in productive, constructive critique. And it should be linked to the weekly theme. So if we're talking about collaboration, you've watched Jim talk about the theory of collaboration. You've watched people from UTS talk about how they do collaboration in their classrooms. You've done a personal reflection on collaboration. You've discussed collaboration in the context of your SIG. Now look at this design group and the work that they're doing and tell them how they can embed more collaboration. So, so you see how the weekly theme kind of weaves through all of the activities and inform these uh, long, these, these scripts that last the entire uh, length of the course. Here's an example of one of the tabs that you would find in your design group. So these are comments from three or four different reviewers who've read, who've looked at your design and are, are giving you feedback on how you can improve it. And then, of course, as I said, we fed the resources into the design groups. Lots of other stuff happened, but we're coming to week six. The week course is almost over. And, you know, even though people had dropped out and, and you know, not everything had worked perfectly, but there was a core group of people who had been creating really good lesson designs, who had had good discussions, and who had really gelled as a community. And, of course, th there was a huge team on OISI and UTS who had been building this together, putting in incredible amounts of hours. And so I was really concerned about how can we go out with a bang and not a whimper. I didn't want to just post on the notice board, okay, that's it, thank you all for participating, see you next year. I wanted to kind of celebrate that community spirit. So I'd already experimented with a component. This was a discussion component, but it, we, we built it ourselves, and it was live updating. So you could see when other people added comments without reloading the page. Um, the idea was you can add, a comment, add an idea, and then you can comment on it, and then you can vote it up. Um, it's a very simple concept. But having that, we built an interface for a live meeting. How do you facilitate a live meeting with hundreds of people? Okay? You can do Google Hangout, but that only works with eight people or so. You can do Google Hangout on air, which broadcasts uh, Google Hangout onto YouTube, but then it's just a video and there's nothing else. Then you can do Google Hangout on air with a chat, but as we all know, it's very difficult for the people who are actually talking to keep track of that chat. So we built this interface. You have a chat on the left side, which you know people can just chat among themselves. You don't have to worry as the presenter. 
then we have this interface here where people can ask questions and other people can vote those questions up. And so you, as the presenter, you only need to focus on the top one. And if you don't like it, you can archive it. Or when you've answered it, you can archive it, which moves to the bottom and the next one comes up. And so that, was, that worked well. And the fact that we then had a Google Hangout with a number of people from the design team and some of the teachers from UTS that had been in those videos all coming together with the students uh, was actually a really wonderful thing. And people in the comments were just super excited. And they also asked us why we hadn't done this every week, which we're like, okay, good, good thing to take for next time. And then we, we went through the lesson designs. There was about maybe 200 lesson designs that got started at one point. Uh, we, want, we wanted to select the ones that were complete because we didn't want people to leave through a bunch of half-abandoned projects. And we found about 30 that were complete. Okay? And complete is not a simple thing. These are long and detailed lesson designs, you know, filling all of the different prompts, considering all of the things we asked them to consider, and we put them into a gallery work that was available to our course, but it's also on the URL that you see at the, on top, um, available to the world. Okay, so we're almost at the end here. We have all these activities that you know, we, we think of as feeding into this community knowledge base that is consistently available as a resource to the students as they're going through the script. And now we can finally put all this together into a schematic presentation of the whole course, which I gave to you in little pieces because I didn't want to overwhelm you. But, uh, and, and this was a post hoc, by the way, analysis. We didn't start with this, although it would have been maybe helpful. We had some analytics tools that uh, let us see at a glance what was going on with all the design groups and actually go and quickly visit them and stuff like that. Again, it was built in week four. Um, it's the kind of thing I think if we had had it at the beginning and if we'd had a group of community TAs that were dedicated to support the design groups, I think it would have made a huge difference. I think a lot of the design groups that dropped off would have needed very little push to continue. And if we ever ran this again or something similar, I think that's the kind of thing that we could iterate over and probably see a, a large increase in, in success. So I'll end there and I'll just suggest a few things that I think are interesting and then I'd love to hear what you guys think or have questions. But I think this idea of scripting across the curriculum, a lot of the design studies that we do are focused on one specific script that might last for a week or might last for a few weeks. You know, how do you do that for a whole class of 12 weeks or six weeks? And I'm suggesting an approach here where you have a fairly consistent weekly structure um, based on themes that inform all of the scripts, but then each week you touch on these scripts that kind of go as, as red threads through the entire curriculum. Oh, I talked about this idea of two strands in the MOOC and interdependence between them, uh, the importance of thinking about how you design groups, and the interesting aspect that the larger the number of students in the course and the more diverse they are, they actually enable the formation of more homogenous groups, right? Because you have more to choose from. And you, could, you have to think about when you're designing the groups from a pedagogical perspective, do you want to optimize for diversity or for hom homogeneity along what dimension, right? I think, so that's something that you have to be very uh, clear about, but you can only do that if you have a student model and if you actually have access to that information about the students. Uh, this idea of, of having enabling content to move across group boundaries we wanted to do a lot more with semantic tagging. Uh, we didn't get to that, but I think that's uh, an area that we should explore more. How do we support small teams collaborating intensely, right? What kind of tools, what kind of uh, scripts? The problem of synchronous and asynchronous, which is especially in online learning, what kind of learning analytics. And finally, and this is the thing that kind of breaks my heart, because I can show you this presentation or I can let you read my thesis, and if you're an instructor at U of T or a MOOC instructor, you might say, Great, I'm convinced, I want to do this, I want to run a MOOC, I want to do this in my 1,000 student con hall class. How? Where do I start? Well, the technology's not there. We wrote all of this by hand, right? And it's all public, it's on GitHub, but it's not something that you can just use in your own class. How can we enable these kinds of more complex scripting for people who don't have a full-time programmer in-house, right? What, is it uh, better protocols? Is it extensions to edX? Is it something completely different? I don't know, but I, I would be very interested in finding out. So, thank you very much. <laughs>